Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending where you're joining us. Uh, my name is Felipe Monteiro. I am a professor of strategy here at INSEAD, and I'll be kind of moderating this conversation today. Um, I'm really delighted that you took some time off a day to spend some time talking about Gen AI, but Gen AI in the context of heavy industries. Um, I'll be in this conversation with two senior executives who are really at the forefront of this conversation. Um, but before we go there and I'm introduce them, um, maybe we should have a conversation on basically the etiquette of the webinar. So as you see, you know, you muted, your video is off. Uh, so there's no chat. On the other hand, Q&A will be our way of communicating. So throughout the webinar, if you have questions, reflections, ideas, please do put them on the Q&A, right? So later in the conversation, we will have a moment to answer those questions. I will invite uh, our panelists to, to answer your questions. So it's very important, please stay engaged. Um, the other thing is, as typically happens in, in those kind of Q&A boxes, there might be a lot of questions there. So feel free not only to put your own questions, but scroll down, see what, other people are putting there and please feel free to to vote so we'll see what are the questions that resonate with most people okay so um a couple of other comments the webinar is being recorded so it's going to be posted later on on inside the different platforms so please be aware of that and if there's anything during the webinar any technical issues there is an email on the screen where you could go and please email us if you had any problem. Um, so moving forward, um, I would like now to invite Chris and Rohan to kind of turn on the videos and, and join us. Uh, welcome Rohan or, or welcome Chris. So as we think about, you know, Gen AI and I'm sure, you know, so many conversations you have been having recently about this topic, uh, we we may talk a lot about Gen AI, I don't know, maybe in healthcare, in media, financial services, but maybe we have kind of discussed less what is the impact of Gen AI on, you know, natural resources, heavy industries. And and here we are having the, the quite unique opportunity to hear from those who are probably in the one of the most important clusters as we think of natural resources in the world, right? So we're delighted to have, you know, um, Rohin Wood. So Rohin is the manager director and partner at the BCGX uh, and Chris Ward, and he's a general manager of Digital Iron Ore at Rio Tinto. Both of them connecting from Perth in Australia. Uh, and without any further ado, I would like to kind of ask uh, each of you to maybe, could you introduce yourselves, give a little, give to us a little bit more background and context on your business. Let me start with you, Rohan. Awesome. Yeah, so um, it's really a privilege to speak to everyone. I mean, I'm really passionate about this topic. Um, so yeah, as Felipe said, I'm a managing director and partner at BCGX. Um, I guess my 30 second bio, I started out life as an aerospace engineer but very quickly realized the thing that I'm really passionate about is maths, computers, and problem solving, which I found out was called operations research. It was a small departure from engineering. And then sort of in recent years, I found myself working in the, in the AI space. Um, I joined BCG about 10 years ago uh, to build the digital part of the business, which is now called BCG X. There's about a dozen of us then. We have about 3,000 now. And what, what we do is build digital solutions, and which is effectively software to help transform our businesses, our clients' businesses and, and to get to outcomes. We work across um, all industries, um, but I personally spend almost all of my time in natural resources. So that's mining and metals and, and oil and gas. Um, and, and definitely, you know, the, the focus of the last five years for me has been how can we apply some of these sort of cutting edge technologies to extract more value in these businesses? Um, and we've had, I'll be honest, it's not been easy. We've had a lot of successes. We've also had a lot of challenges that we've had to overcome. So, and I'm really excited to be able to share so some of what we've learned over that journey with this audience. Uh, thank you, Rohan. Do you want to say kind of a few words just about what BCGX means? 
BCG X, yeah, I mean, it's 75% the same as BCG, right? Um, we're the digital arm of BCG. So we, we are data scientists, engineers, solution architects. Basically, we build the software and we partner closely with the core part of the business, which is BCG, to bring that kind of um, offering of not just the tech, but also the people and process side of things as a sort of to, to really make change happen in a business and to sort of deliver what you need to actually get to an outcome. Thank you so much. And thanks again for joining us, uh, Chris. Right. Uh, good evening again and good afternoon and good morning to everybody on the call. Um, as I said, we are, we are dialing in from Perth, which is actually Wajak Nunga country. Um, it's actually privileged to be here on the call today. So what I'll probably do is I'll we'll just give a little bit of a 30 second bio of myself and then probably a little bit more context of what Rio Tinto Iron Ore is and Rio Tinto as an organization, because I do appreciate there's a lot of people on this call that are, are not, uh, who don't uh, really um, work that closely with the resource industry. So from a, a quick, who am I? I guess I've been uh, working in mining or mining related industries for more than 20 years as well as had brief exposure to banking and consulting and to be uh, sort of not too uh, brief time as a lecturer at a large university. So I really appreciate the academic aspect of the work that we do. But more from a Rio Tinto perspective, being here in Rio Tinto for the last 18 years and held you know, leadership roles in finance, technical operations, and over the last few years have moved more into this uh, digital space. And it's a really exciting space for us to be in, in terms of a iron ore company. But maybe I'll probably best to give you a little bit of context about our business, if that's okay, uh, please. Felipe. Please, please do so. So, Rio Tinto, very large diversified mining and processing company, footprint rough on six continents. We employ just over 52,000 people worldwide and of which 17,000 of those are here in Rio Tinto Iron Ore. As a company, uh, our purpose is to find better ways to provide the material the world needs. So really focused on that resource industry. From a Rio Tinto Iron Ore perspective, as the name implies, we mine and process iron ore um, in the Northwestern part of Western Australia, uh, which is known as the Pilbara region. And I'll probably give some further context um, from a scale perspective. So we are also the world's largest integrated mine and the world's largest heavy industrial complex. And to wow. give sort of that feel for geographical span, it's the sort of the size of Spain in which we operate the Pilbara region. Um, we started our operations back in 1966. So a large uh, development of mines up to our current mine uh, suite which is now 17 mines and we produce a blended product and currently we mine about 110 pits at any one time simultaneously and we run it all as a system to produce roughly about a million tons of uh, bulk commodity per day um, to our customers and effectively mining roughly a billion tons of material per year and for all the sports fans out there and i'm sure there are a few on the call we mine about the size of any large sporting complex to the roof every day in our operations. So it's a really large scale. What a lot of people don't appreciate is we've also invested significantly and are, I guess, pioneers in autonomous drills, trucks, trains, and plants. And we do control that here in Perth, uh, which is about at one and a half thousand kilometers south of our assets. And always people like to hear some fun statistics. So if you will indulge me, I'll talk a few of, of our large statistics, really to talk about scale, but also to appreciate um, that our sequence and um, our development has been over several decades. So we don't have this great world where we can go for perfect greenfields operations. A lot of ours is integrations with old archaic systems that we have developed over the decades. So as I said, 17 mines, we own and manage all, and we run as a, as a collective integrated system. We have just under 1,900 kilometers of rail, which is the world's largest privately owned heavy haul rail network with over 50 train sets. So I try and really keep it simple. Um, from the 50, the 50 train sets, remember these are effectively uh, driverless trains. It has 220 locomotives pulling about 13 and a half thousand wagons. Each train two and a half kilometers long, just under 
um, and about 28,500 tons of material per train. We also run two ports, four port terminals, four gas-powered power stations, one so uh, solar photovoltaic farm out uh, at our latest mine site called Buda Dari. We have 500 haul trucks, of which about three quarters are automated, um, over 60 production trolls, almost half automated, and we sell to more than 100 customers globally. But in really, in summary, you know, scales matters. We are very large, complex, integrated system, and we've evolved over the last uh, five decades. But we have been a pioneer in what we call large-scale autonomous equipment systems and remote operations. And this is a truly unique industrial complex that we, we operate in. Thank you. Well, Chris, I mean, now when people see the name Rio Tinto, I think they will have a number of stats to go with that name that many times people just heard that they say, yes, yeah, it's a large you know, mining company. Now you, you gave us a lot of context to that. Uh, so if you just joined the call, I mean, I hope you have the feeling that you were talking, right? You're, got, you're talking to the GAFA, of the you know, natural resources uh, industry. This is you know, two people who are really at the forefront of it. So the conversation today is about GNAI, right? And if we were talking to a lot of the digital businesses, right, they are really at the forefront of it. And there's so many news, right, on Microsoft and OpenAI and Google, et cetera. When we go right and we think about traditional non-digital non -dig digital native industries, right? Um, many people say, no, maybe you lag behind in terms of adoption of AI. So I would like to hear perspectives on this, Chris, and maybe you know why this is the case, if you do agree, and why this is the case. Let me start with you, Chris. Uh, how do you compare right, yourselves with you no, know, and I'm speaking more broadly, right? Of you as a as a company in that sector uh, in terms of timing and potential lag in adoption of AI? Look, that, that's a great, uh, great question. I suppose the truth is that in resources, we don't need to lead in AI as our competitive advantage is really in the physical world. We innovate with AI largely with the engineering, as I said, really around the operations technology, such as automation and remote operations. Our competitive advantage really lies in the large part due to our ore bodies and the, 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 our ability to deploy large capital to extract the ore efficiently within the Pilbara. And I guess, uh, as you would imagine, no amount of AI can unfortunately conjure up a new ore body, although admittedly it can help us find them. So I guess if you're a native digital business, like online marketing platforms, for example, you need to lead in AI or you'll be out of business. We don't have the same, I guess, what we call a survival dynamic for AI innovation. We do understand engineering automation very well, and we are leaders in this field. But that said, there's still a huge amount of value to be gained from AI, and we have the benefit of being able to adopt mature technologies developed by our digital native business friends. A lot, I'm sure, are on this call. It is an area where we don't have to be first movers, as we have a number of high value opportunities elsewhere. AI. Uh, really competes for this investment. Don't get me wrong. We know that there's value to be had and we are actively pursuing the value in this space. You know, for example, we invest heavily in the AI in the maintenance to minimize failures, maximize availability. We are extremely mature in, in deploying AI in processing and engineering applications, but still learning more in the functional applications of this. Thank you, Chris. Yeah, I mean, what's your take on this? No, I think Chris has hit the nail on the head, right? Like, as in, you don't have to be good. You're going to make money either way. If you've got a high high grade ore body close to the surface, you know, um, you can run it terribly and still make money. So without people like Chris pushing businesses to find the, the last billion, it just doesn't happen. And the company, you know, stays in solvent anyway. Um, yeah, and, and survival is quite a strong motivator to do stuff. Um, so in other industries, as Chris says, where, you know, um, people have to worry, um, you know, a, a lot about these things and then, um, then they, you know, uh, AI is more of a competitive thing. But I think there's one other point, um, which is more associated with the technology. Um, I mean, and there are really two components. One is when we use AI in, in natural resources, it just doesn't scale as well as it does in most sort of digital native businesses. And, and a lot of digital native businesses are B2C. So what are you actually doing when you're using AI? You tend, you're typically trying to build some kind of a model. Uh, and typically, if you're a B2C business, 
you're building a model of a customer and you're trying to use that model to predict whether or not Rowan will buy, you know, golf clubs or a hockey stick. Um, and actually that's not too dissimilar to whether or not I'll buy a mortgage, you know, fixed rate at, you know, 6% or variable rate at 7% or whatever it happens to be, right? Like it's, it's about fundamentally modeling human propensities and that we've seen that scales quite well. And a lot of businesses, um, you know, grow, grew really quickly in that kind of B2C space. Um, it doesn't work that way at all in mining, right? If I build an AI model of a crushing circuit, that model helps me in no way at all to operate a truck. And if I build a model of a truck, that 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 model in no way at all helps me to operate a train. So it just um, it, it doesn't scale, and you need a, you know very specific domain expertise to be able to build the AI models to be able to optimize those pieces of equipment. And that gets pretty expensive as well, right? So you've got to be pretty deliberate in where you actually choose to deploy this technology um, because you know, um, you got to do it every time again for each piece of equipment. And then the second thing I think we have in, in natural resources um, that's different is we just don't have as much data. I mean, yeah, we've got heaps of data, right? Everyone's got heaps of data, but we don't have billions of clicks on websites to specifically figure out the incremental probability of a 41 year old white guy in Perth clicking on um, a particular product, right? I've built a lot of models of like grinding machines and typically it's only been six to 12 months since the light, they last calibrated the sensor. So you're generally only working with a finite amount of data to build your models and you need to supplement that with something. And we've had a lot of, a lot of luck of, you know, cause what you're dealing with is a fundamental lack of information. We've had a lot of luck supplementing that with you know, what we know from engineering and physics and using things like Bayesian inference to kind of make up for the lack of information in the data, but it's still a limitation. Um, so I think, you know, Chris has given the real reason, which is the business reason and follow the money. I think that there's other reasons, which are technical reasons, which are the, you know, the, the two that I've just outlined. Super. And I mean, for those of you uh, who are listening to this conversation, you know, and some of you might be mining, in you no know, in natural resources i i was just looking you know at the stats of people who sign up for this right there are a lot of people from energy chemical utilities so i hope you no know, those lessons we're hearing from rohan and chris uh make sense to you i also see there are some questions starting to pop up in the q a's uh box so please feel free to go and post questions and my my next question to both of you is I don't know, you know, I mean, the amount of hype that there has been on, you know, on Gen AI uh, is amazing, right? So everything became about Gen AI, right? Every conference we go, uh, what you read in the papers. So I was, you know, when, when I was hearing your introductions and you were saying you know, for how long you've been working in that space, uh, I was hoping that you could give us some perspective on what is different now. Okay, so how do you compare? And Chris, you will talk about you know, automation, you know, what you have done so, for so long on automation. So can you give us some perspective on, on this? You know, How do you compare what we're living now to previous generation of AI and what are the real consequences? So Rohan, let me start with you. Yeah, thanks, Luke. I mean, I would start by saying, but well, we are seeing things today that I never thought I'd see in my life, right? It's wild. And, and this generative AI sort of wave is just, um, coming at us at a speed that's hard to metabolize. And I think there's three massive differences. I mean, there's many differences, but for me, the top three are firstly, this concept of foundation models, right? So historically, if you wanted to build an AI use case, you kind of had to build and pay for the whole thing yourself, right? Um, you know, but with generative AI, you can buy these kind of pre-trained models off the shelf and they do useful things. These foundation models that are kind of general purpose models. So it's sort of equivalent to if you wanted a worker you know, the old school AI was you had to birth the worker and, you know, feed it and pay for its private school fees. And, and then, you know, you know, 21 years later, you'll have someone that can do something useful like wash the dishes, right? Now you can just buy the human or the AI and tell it to wash the dishes and it does something useful. I mean, an example, I'll give you an example. We, um, we did some work for an oil and gas business looking at maintenance strategy and all of their data sits in free text kind of notice, right? Notifications the engineers have written. There's 200,000 of them. Uh, we we spent about um, six weeks building an algorithm that tried to be smart about looking at the text, figuring out keywords, and then classify it. Simply, is this a failure or is this not a failure? Right. And after about six weeks, we got it to about eighty percent accurately based on accuracy based on a sort of ground truth sample. This was kind of around about the time when GPT three and a half 
was released. And we thought, well, let's just see what happens if we just ask GPT to do it. Like, can you read this and tell me, um, you know, like if it's a failure or not? And it got it right 90% of the time. Then we gave it its errors and we said, here's some of the ones you got wrong. Can you see what you got wrong? Can you tell me what I need to tell you next time to get it better to, to improve? And we got it up to 95%. So I think that the consequence of that is just the economics of AI is fundamentally shifting. Um, it, the cost is dropping substantially. There are a load of use cases that are now like, um, you know, possible that just weren't, weren't, weren't economically feasible like even six months ago. Um, I think the second, the second big difference um, is around just the democratization, right? Like, I mean, for those of you on the line that haven't checked out GPT-40 yet, it's amazing, right? Just Google the, find the, the just finish, maybe after this webinar, but find the links on YouTube and watch the release of that. You will not be disappointed, right? It's like, literally like you're talking to the, you know, what's that movie with Jacqueline Phoenix, her with the, you know, the AI and the phone. Um, so you don't, need to be able to code anymore right like you don't you don't you don't you no longer need a degree in data science you can interact with this stuff in a natural way and that's clearly part of the strategy of a company like open AI. i think it's brilliant um uh you know it's kind of terrifying to figure out what it might do to us well hopefully it's it's you know hopefully it's a lot like i'm very optimistic but um it's going to be incredibly disruptive because you're now giving the kind of the power of ai to everyone and then i, I guess the third thing which i'm really excited about is um, potentially its ability to understand causality. So before GPT, um, I remember right at the start, I mentioned we made a bunch of mistakes when we first started applying AI. Yeah. Like AI, which was basically machine learning, is basically a kind of curve fitting technique. It's looking for correlation. It doesn't understand the physical thing. So you would train a neural network to try to understand how a piece of equipment works. For example, a beneficiation plant. In many mining circuits, there's a piece of equipment that strips out the waste so but it also strips out a little bit of the val valuable mineral and you don't want it to strip out too much and there are kind of levers you can tweak to to, to minimize the loss um if you just blindly train one of these neural networks that has no idea about physics um or, or, or you know chemistry it will give you completely nonsense answers it'll kind of find correlations that are as useful as oh, on days when it was good it was pretty good so just make it a good day um you the only solution we were able to find to that was to overlay what we knew to be true from physics and engineering um, to prevent the AI from learning nonsense, right? So, and this is these Bayesian inference techniques I mentioned before. Effectively, it's just kind of very good engineering is another way to think about it. Um, but these GPT algorithms, it's almost like they understand, I mean, do they think the way we think? Do they use model-based realism? I don't know. Well, we do know that all they're, all they're trying to do is predict the next token. But it, once you do that at the scale that companies, well, you know, like, you know, Google and OpenAI are doing, the emerging characteristic of this thing is incredible. It appears to understand, you know, cause and effect. Um, so I think the consequence of that, I haven't even, like, I don't think we've fully thought through yet, but and that is, 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 is the characteristic which is going to unlock a whole bunch of things that weren't possible before. Uh, Rohan, before I go to Chris, let me ask a follow-up question because, you know, I see here a lot of the people who, re who register Alpha Consulting Services and, you know, I see some familiar names there, former students, you know, oh, I mean, as you know, right, the NCAD and BCG and, you know, we work so much with consulting firms as kind of a lot of our students end up going, you know, what has been the main change for you in terms of consulting and the people that you hire as we think about, is, is Gen AI really different? Yeah, well, I mean, I think if you look over the last 10 years, how has it changed my business? Like, I wouldn't be a partner at BCG. I was me and one other guy from um, the Nordics were the first two partners of BCG elected, not because we know how to do PowerPoint and strategy, but because we know how to write code. So it's kind of like fundamentally disrupted, you know, our business because to be able to provide, um, you know, advice to clients to get to outcomes and to be able to provide solutions to clients to get the outcomes you need to be able to deliver digital solutions so certainly the impact on the consulting industry is i think that um we've all realized we need this muscle this digital muscle like i um obviously you know i'm not going to talk about the competition i'd like to believe that we're in front you know you can look at the forester rankings like we started this a long time ago because we saw that this was this was a massive opportunity um so yeah i think it's and it's not it's not like you know, BCG X and BCG both work together to offer that kind of combined solution to clients because you need the human side 
and the tech side to get to an outcome. So that's that's what's changed, um, I guess, the business. In terms of, I think the question you might have been asking is around how is Gen AI um, changing the way we do consulting? Like already, like uh, most of my team use it, you know what I mean? For testing storylines, for giving, you give it a slide and you give it, like we give it our training guide on how to do good, you know, um, hypothesis-based you know, you know, consulting and give me some criticism on that. Um, you know, it's it gets to a half decent answer when you just ask it flat out. Like, you know, what what's the what are the ten things I need to worry about um, in this business? Um, so using that a lot, we're using it um, a lot um, um, in um, in like knowledge management and so forth. Um, my wife uses it a lot at university. No, she's not at INSEAD. Her university's banned it, which I think is a terrible idea. But I think for coaching and training, um, it, it, that's that's a a really important thing as well. I don't think people are using it enough. Like uh, I, I think a lot of people have their heads in the sand and I'm often finding that I'm, you know, pushing people to just, just try and see what this thing can do. Cause you know, once you see it, you'll want to, you'll, you'll want to use it. I cannot agree more. Uh, thank you, Rohan. Chris, is this different from things that we have seen before and that you have been doing in terms of automation and other use of AI? Thanks. <clears throat> I'll probably echo a lot of Rowan's comments on this. It's it's an amazing technology to think that it's just over a year old is just incredible. And we're all talking about it. And it seems I, I agree, if you don't have the word AI, you can't go to a conference these days in, in your title or in, in the name of your presentation. Um, but that aside, I think it's what is really is amazing in terms of what I'm seeing from it is, is that really ability to automate basic and semi complex tasks out of the box. Um, and to really rapidly and automatically extract, I guess, that insights from data. Um, I always say it's easy to understand correlation and causation and some of the works, uh, some of the words that Rowan was talking about, and often people get those two confused. Interestingly enough, um, the latest uh, chat GPT-4s and similars uh, seem to know the difference and they just know it. Um, and that's <laughs> incredibly powerful. And you know, often when we're dealing with huge data sets and complications in our world, Sometimes it's hard to understand the difference between the causation and correlation. Maybe I'll do it a baby dip differently and I'll use a worked example and I'm gonna use a, a GM team. So our GM team really is as you know, a typical large corporate GM team, outstanding individuals, but they've probably been off the tools for a while. I mean, can you clarify well, what, what we, you mean by GM teams, uh, Chris? Uh, a general manager team. So that's uh, you know, a leadership Thank team you. within 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 my business. Um, we decided let, let's let's run a workshop where we took about a dozen uh, of, of the general managers and gave them 10 years of daily port performance data. And then ask them to run a continuous improvement project on the car dumpers. Now, for context, the car dumpers are the machines that unload those trains. So each train has 240 wagons. You offload them uh, two at a time, and you're and you're running sort of 30 plus trains a day on the network. So huge amounts of data, and with very little um, scripting. And typically, this is the the job, I guess, of a data analyst with you know really deep specific domain knowledge of car dumpers, trains, material types, uh, throughputs, et cetera. And they generally will spend days going through the data to make sure that they understand exactly what's driving it. Now, coming back to the, the general manager team, um, we uploaded it to simple chat GPT-4 um, and had it write the code needed to perform sort of calculations to benchmark the dumpers against each other and then identify you know, the drivers of poor performance really almost little or no scripting or intelligence, just uploading the sort of the data, again, in our private instance that we have here at Rio Tinto, and really running through and understanding what the data is. The results were absolutely amazing. Within about 15 minutes, uh, one of the general manager's comments to, to us was, I cannot unsee this. And, and another remark is, you know, what is the role of an analyst now? And more importantly, from our side, it was great to see the, the general managers get really excited about data as a, as a commodity and value the data and therefore de derive the insights from that. I've never seen such an engaged team. Wonderful. So before I, we move to the next question, uh, let me just invite kind of those on the call. So I see there are a number of questions in the Q&A box. 
uh, please take a look at them, you know, vote, include new questions. So when we open up in about 15 minutes for Q&A, right, we can go through your questions. So, I mean, you already mentioned some of those, but I was wondering if both of you could spend some time just giving us some very concrete examples of use cases, you know, how you're driving value out of them. Uh, so, Chris, anything, you know, and, and thanks so much for, you know, materializing to us who are not necessarily familiar with the mining industry, you know, what it means. So as we think about use cases for you, what, what, what it means, right? Uh, and where value comes from that. Fantastic. And thank you. I've been trying not to use acronyms and certainly when you add to digital and mining, it's very hard not to. So please forgive me if I miss a few. Um, AI, I will take as a given. Um, so yeah, we've deployed quite a number of use cases and I'm going to give maybe a, a few just to flavor of what we are doing. So I'll give one which is non-traditional mining, which is probably relevant to most of the people uh, on this call. And that's really around people analytics. Like many companies, we run a regular survey to really understand how our employees are feeling. And from that, it generates thousands of written comments uh, and those are submitted. And from our perspective, we really wanna make sure we understand all the key themes important to our people so that we can act on it. Typically, this takes an analyst a month um, to do that. And that's used in the normal traditional sentiment analysis technique. Um, we paired it against the Gen AI. It took less than two days with a little guidance, I guess, from the data scientists, uh, getting the right scripting and the prompting. And really, when we sort of compared both of those approaches, which are traditional versus the Gen AI, the Gen AI was not only faster by orders of magnitude, but it also came up with a deeper level of uh, insight. It hmm. identified themes that the data analyst had missed or potentially had bias. And, um, you know, it gave us really those deep uh, technical pieces that we just wouldn't have seen if we hadn't have had uh, access to that technology. But it was also able to read not just the comments from this year, or but all previous years. And I think that was the superpower of that. It, it started to identify trends for the first time. And we could see where, where we had uh, deliberate interventions, the outcomes of those, were they successful, did it change sentiment, et cetera. So incredibly powerful. And then going to more traditional type of uh, applications using sort of things in ChatGPT4 or, or equivalents or Copilot. You know, we've got the really ones on the coding side because that's where a lot of our work sits, um, on, especially on the deprec deprecation of old systems. So that really that code translations so example, Java or Visual Basic to TypeScript, a little bit messy, hit and miss, um, but it gets most of the bulk of the work done. Um, thought partnering for code design, so APIs, really valuable for even experienced developers. The obvious is debugging, the sort of replacement of the Google or Stack Overflow. It's more targeted search, provides code examples, which is absolutely fantastic. In learning a new programming language, you don't need a university sometimes to teach you this type of stuff or some form of tertiary. It's, you know, it's really about how do you prompt. Um, so as an example, when we are moving some of our old uh, VB3 or Visual Basic 3 and 6 into TypeScript, we just use the prompt, how can I filter an array in TypeScript? Can you give examples? <laughs> Interestingly enough, we always tend to see with people who first interact with the please and you know all the, the niceties that come with uh, how we interact with effectively a machine. So that's been a, a bit of an interesting uh, uh, way of how we script. But then the typically code order completion, code refactoring, documentations. And I think a lot of the people on the call are probably interested in, well, has it been of value? From our perspective, we've seen a significant um, increase of our coders productivity, probably in the 20 to 30% improvement in code productivity. And then we have a myriad of other successful use cases, mostly largely around those synthesizing those large data sets that require natural language processing, summarizing sort of the copilot type uh, best use cases and really getting value out of our historic documentation and understanding. So absolutely, we are deploying it in many, many use cases. Um, the challenge is going for is how do we industrialize some of those, um, those uh, use cases? Thanks. Thank you, Chris.
I mean, just to maybe to illustrate, can you share a little bit? I mean, what is the profile of your team? You know, how many people are working on this? Because you, you seem to be doing so many things. I mean, what's the what's the size profile of that team? So we are partnering with many different partners throughout. So my mm. team is in the order of about 140 people doing a variety. We've got many contractors and then many um, partners that we use. So several hundred people strong in this space. Um, again, from a, a organization of over 17,000, it's, it's not a significant portion, but certainly we are now centralizing and, and really trying to get the best value out of our current resources. And also, as I said right in the beginning, is choosing our use cases for the highest value. So we are not um, you know, trying to do everything um, using these type of new technologies. We really targeted in, in the highest value use cases and also trying to learn and understand this in our context. Uh, you know, as examples, all bodies are naturally variable um, and they're all unique. So you have to really target it and, and tailor it to those type of um, problem uh, solving issues. And all plants are relatively unique, although a lot of them are common. So it's really about understanding the best use of the technology for the biggest um, value to be un unlocked whilst we compete with so many other incredible opportunities in our OT or operations technology space. Super, thank you, Chris. Rohan, use cases for you. Yeah, look, I think maybe I'll talk about, I mean, the use cases, but within the framework of like, how is this thing gonna drive value in general? Mm -hmm. And I think um, maybe at some point it will replace workers. Um, I, I was, I was more confident that wasn't going to happen yesterday. Um, but uh, but I think at least in the interim, I mean, the what, what it's going to do is basically drive worker productivity, right? And it's going it's doing that in two ways. It is doing that already. Like it's it's um increase it's it's automating repetitive tasks, like Chris says, you know, like whether that be you know, reading through documents and summarizing them, or whether that be, you know, um turning large amounts of you know unstructured text data into text data. Um, and to be honest, I think a lot of that's happening through kind of shadow IT in businesses where people are just firing up GPT in their browser and probably going home early, uh, which is great. You know, it's a bit of um, you know, welfare for society that people getting extra spare time. Um, but I think there's a lot more that can be done. I, I think that, um, you know, beyond kind of the, the kind of efficiency gain of automating a lot of, of, of tasks that employees have to do, I think we're going to see a world in which these you know, the, these agents start to make our employees smarter. You know what I mean? Because if you think about how employees deliver value to a business, their effectiveness effectively, it comes down to the quality of their decision-making. And, and as, you know, um, as those of you who will have seen 4.0 GPT, their new desktop-based application, clearly what they're trying to do is create this co-pilot that can coach you and guide you to make better decisions and, and deliver better outcomes. I mean, you, you're kind of seeing this already, you know, certainly, as I mentioned before, my wife at university uses it as a tutor. I know that there are sort of startups that are kind of um, figuring out how to teach kids maths with these sorts of things. But I think that that's the next kind of wave is that how do we how do we use these things that are now good enough to stand to understand causalities, as Chris says, to kind of guide us towards better decisions to drive value, um, you know, for businesses. And then and I guess um, coming back to my opening point around like will these things replace us um, and why am I less sure today than I was yesterday so um, when I started thinking about what I'd say in answer to you know on this on this call uh -huh. I was going to say that you know we as humans have a competitive advantage from the AI because we have access to a lot of the information and data that exists in the universe that isn't in the computer you know what I mean we are the conduit so as awesome as GPT is if it doesn't have the data, if it hasn't seen the picture or if it hasn't heard the, the song or it hasn't spoken to the client, it doesn't have that information. So we are the natural conduit. But then when you look at what, what tech companies are starting to do by basically making these algorithms like text native, so instead of going text, you know, speech, text, algorithm, text, speech, it's just speech, speech, and then integrating multi-modes. So these, you know, you can now talk to your phone and it can see you through the camera. You know, I mean, whack some arms on the camera. What have you got, right? You've now got, you're starting to move close towards um, something that feels very much like a, a, you know, AI that I thought I'd never see in my lifetime, but I'm pretty sure we're going to see in a year or two. And and for me, that is that is just um, incredibly exciting. Um, yeah. 
definitely very exciting. And that comes to my last question before we open up, which is, you know, if you were to give an advice, right, to people listening to us today live, but you know, there's going to be published right on YouTube and these platforms, right? And people say, wow, okay, what advice would you give? And I maybe let me part my advice, my question two parts. You know, maybe there are people who are like you, right? Doing this as main, right? You are the forefront of it. You are leading it. You are really, you know, people who are investing your lives, right? And your professional lives on this. But maybe there are people here in this call who, who kind of see us later and say, say okay, okay, I'm not yet sure what to do with this. So what advice would you give to both types of, you know, situations? Uh, let me start with you, Chris. If you were to give a couple of advice, what would those be? Fantastic. I could be here all day with advice, but I'll try and keep it as succinct as I can. Well, I think we tend to focus on technology, the actual technology. We cannot forget the people and process that sit behind that. So my first piece of advice is really focus on the people and process as much as the underlying technology. The technology now is a commodity the people in process are a lot harder to work through. So that my first piece of advice is that, yes, it will make, as Rowan said, make our people smarter, but not all, it won't have access to all the information because that's not all codified. And we've seen that play out in our industry is as we deploy a lot of AI type technologies, um, we find out more and more what's not in the system, what that was being done over telephones and um, through other conversations and Teams chats, et cetera. So, it will be make our people smarter, but not all information is codified and ultimately people in process. Another piece of, uh, you know, advice is really encourage responsible experimentation. You mm -hmm. know, the capability of Gen AI is evolving as we know so quickly, as Rowan said today, a new version's come out. It's, it's, it's moved forward at really incredible speed. And really, so how do we do that and as a business, how do we evolve to unlock the, the potential that this new technology um, has to offer? And I guess another piece is probably never before has this type of technology been so accessible. You know, most tools or these type of digital tools, um, you know, are hard to access. Nowadays, it's a web browser. I've got it on my phone. Um, it's really great for holidays, by the way. And um, you don't need any coding knowledge. So if you are looking for deep coders, I'm not sure that, that you know, that, that, that future of deep code knowledge is going to be as important um, as rather our ability to, to ask the right critical questions and use natural human language. I think that's going to be, you know, is going to be important. And then lastly, if I think back to the, Hewlett Packard 35 scientific calculator. I think that was put out in what 1972. It didn't replace maths or ability for our countless students uh, now using modern handheld calculators or personal computers in any secondary or tertiary exams. Um, Gen AI will, will become another tool to use um, to enhance productivity. And really embrace it, I guess, but beware of its limitations and understand its hallucinations. So really, that, but do I use it every day? Absolutely. Similar Rowan, to Rowan, I have a wife who's using this also in the resource industry with incredible success and really being able to understand and synthesize data at a rate that was never possible in the past. Super valuable advice. Thank you, Chris. Rowan. I think, yeah, great advice, Chris. I'm going to address first the skeptics, um, as you've asked me to, Felipe. Like, uh -huh. probably thinking like, I heard this before. This is this crypto blockchain nonsense, right? Like what happened to that? Um, so like I was a bit, I was you know, a big fan of blockchain because it's quite a beautiful thing and, you know, but that, you know, and, and got into the whole crypto thing, but it didn't take much unpicking to figure out is this blockchain thing going to live up to the hype? You could quickly see it's not, right? This Gen AI thing is different. And I know you think, I know you'll say, well, of course you would say that, but just look at it, right? Like to what Chris, as what Chris said, right? You cannot unsee this thing. When you start to see what it can do and you play around with it, you get it to write your code, you get it to do work for you, you get it to plan your itinerary, 
you you know that you'll start to have your eyes open to the world of possibility of what can be done um so then i guess my advice to the everyone not just the skeptics is you've got to invest in this right this is more it's going to be more disruptive than the computer and you have an opportunity to invest in it like whether that you know there's going to be a lot of people that get really rich you probably want to be one of them and you want your business to be one of the businesses that survives through this transition so either invest you know by you know, buying ETFs that are exposed to these sorts of stuff or invest in your business, you know what I mean? Like invest in in playing, you know, to Chris's point, in experimenting with it, in trying different things. It won't take you long to find a use case um, that, you know, blows your boss's socks off. Or if you are the boss, um, as many of you are on this call, that, you know, impresses the board. Um, so, yeah, invest. That would be that would be my, my number one piece of advice. Thank you so much. So... We have a number of questions here. Uh, so I will start with the ones that are on the top of the list that have received more votes. And I think there are actually two questions from Stefan that are about the same topic, which is to what extent uh, you're using AI to increase the likelihood to find new resources deposit, right? And I think the context on this is no large oil and gas companies seem to be using this. Uh, do you also apply this to mining? So absolutely. So similar to um, oil and gas, we have incredibly huge um, geological models, some of the biggest models on the planet um, to try and uh, crunch through. So are we using AI? Absolutely in this space. Uh, are we using generative AI? Absolutely in understanding historic records, tables, intercepts um, from you know, a variety of um, sources. So we are using and deploying that well. I'm not that familiar with that side of our business, um, but certainly I do know that we use it extensively. And probably all the mining um, companies and oil and gas companies have been doing so at the forefront of that for decades. Yeah. So yeah, absolutely, my, we do that. Totally spot. I mean, from my perspective, having spoken to a number of businesses in this space, I think there was a lot of disappointment in this idea in the original kind of machine learning wave of AI. And it comes back to that fundamental problem of causality versus correlation. So literally I've heard stories of people training convolutional neural networks to find um, you know, deposits, but they're trained on known deposits, which obviously are near large pieces of infrastructure already. So they don't, they don't learn where the deposit is, they learn where the infrastructure is. Um, so then when it, you know, when they get, when you ask it where new deposits are, it gets it totally wrong, right? It's not necessarily learning the causal um, relationships. And, and I've heard plenty of stories where, you know, where, you know, there is no road to El Dorado, right? We went and drilled and there was nothing there. Um, but I think it, 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 that doesn't mean we should give up, right? I've also heard several, you know, success stories in this space as well. And I think to Chris's point, you know, as we start to figure out how to take more advantage of, like generative AI's ability to understand cause and effect and causality, that will kind of really unlock some of these kind of prospecting type um, use cases. Thank and, you. Both. And I think just to add to that, where, where it's really quite powerful is it really links disparate data sets together in a way that we haven't been able to in the past with the technology. Mm -hmm. So that's really an important part of what we are seeing in terms of the value. It's getting very complex and different data sets and finding that uh, causation and correlation within those. And I think, you know, that's been incredibly uh, powerful for us um, to really um, develop our current operations whilst also finding new um, deposits around the world. Super. I mean, let me ask a quick follow-up question. And I know you don't have a crystal ball, but I think if we were having this conversation in one year, right, or two years, do you have any sense why? I mean, how fast things will develop, right? In that realm that we're discussing here. Any guess? Do you want to start, Chris? I mean, if you know, mate, like tell me and I'm going to, oh, you know, rich man. I, I was about to say the same thing, Rowan. Um, it is, from our perspective, it it is a, we are still learning deeply in the space. So as I said, AI, we are using it advanced and we are really focused on the process and engineering aspects and absolutely have been leading in that space for, for a number of years. Going forward is how do we bring it into the non-traditional engineering and, and um, those type of areas? That to me is going to be where we're gonna see a fundamental shift. 
So we are starting to see the use cases um, um, develop, industrialize, and we're starting to see more and more. And it's like, hey, once we've learned how to do it, hey, how do we apply it to this area? And like I said, we are learning also from the rest of the industries out there who are more in the forefront of doing this on a day-to-day -day basis. But certainly from our perspective, a year from now, it is going to be different. Is it going to be materially different um, for us? I think, uh, yeah, that's that that I can't bet on. Um, but certainly, I do believe it will be different, um, and it'll be different in a positive manner in terms of the use of technology. But like I said right from the beginning, a people and process change takes a lot longer than a year, and that's what we we mustn't forget. As an example, we we have sort of um, these these very complicated algorithms and AR boxes, the teams don't respond well to, to a algorithm that comes up with a different answer. They really want to understand why. And, you know, we've had to interestingly use generative AI to actually explain what the black box was doing. Um, and that's a really important insight, but really taking people through that change journey does take time. Maybe over to Rowan. Yeah, I mean, I don't know is the answer, but what I would say is like, I guess the I'll answer a slightly different question, which is like, what do you, should you do about it? Cause I don't know where X will be in a year, but I know what the gradient is now and it's going to be, it's wild. Yeah. Um, so I think maybe coming back to sort of some of the points I've made at the start, Rio will still be in business um, because their competitive advantage, you know, remains. Um, there'll be a bunch of businesses that um, are fine, you know what I mean? But, uh, and there'll be other businesses that are completely disrupted, you know, print media and all like a lot, a lot of, you know, if you're a purely digital business, you know, I, I, I would be thinking you really need to think quite, you know, uh, you know quite a lot about how is this thing going to disrupt me? Or if, if you have, if you're purely based on, in, on um, human capital as well, right? If you run call centers or something like that, this thing obviously is going to um, have a massive impact you know how you could probably run a call center with a computer now right because you just have virtual kind of agents um so i think that what we're going to see is huge amounts of disruption huge shifting in value pools like there's some really interesting questions around um who gets the value is it going to be the consumer is it going to be the businesses i think in many cases it's going to be the consumer but basically yeah there's going to be a, a massive amount of disruption wherever we have you know human capital doing repetitive tasks um, and it's really important to understand in your business kind of how exposed are you to this this wave of disruption? Because I don't think everyone on this call is in as privileged position as the likes of Rio Tinto and most of the other natural resources companies up and down the terrace here in Perth. Thank you. I mean, we have seven minutes left, so I'll, I'll try to go quickly, at least to the ones on the top. So, I mean, there are two questions that talk about FOMO, right? The fear of missing out. Uh, how you are thinking about it, right? And I mean, there's a question about, you know, how do you really choose where value really lies in your business, right? And I think Chris, you already alluded to that in terms of choosing where to play. Uh, I think second question is about, you know, that, you know, do you encounter in employees, right? This, that are involved over Gen AI, a kind of stress to keep up, right? Like a FOMO. So maybe if each of you can quickly react to this, it'll be wonderful. Yeah. I'll quickly start maybe, Chris. Um, so yeah, like you should have FOMO is my answer to that. You know, like um, you should be on this right now. There's a reason that humans experience that emotion because it's served us well for thousands of years. Um, uh, yeah, and in terms of, I guess the, I, the the reaction I've seen is not so much FOMO as kind of resistance. A lot of people don't believe, they don't want to believe this is real. So you kind of have to push people to experience it. Um, because, you know, and then they'll deal with it. Once they've seen it, they can't unsee it, as Chris says. Um, yeah, I mean, that, that would be that would be my response to that. You should have FOMO. Chris, what do you think, mate? I'm cautiously optimistic, I guess, um, from my, my experience. You know, it's really around how do we, we as a, a organization lead through what's fundamentally a disruptive technology that we probably haven't seen since, I guess, the the advent of a, of a calculator, as I said. So from a from us, it's really the way we choose to the back to the original question. It's really around, obviously, we, we will choose high value opportunities, but we also choose 
what we what would be deemed intangible value like people experience we are spending a lot of time using this technology to improve our, our team members experience and you know that's a lot of the feedback we get through um you know our, our regular uh, people the check-ins is we people want to work in areas that they feel empowered this is the tool that empowers them and that gives them more energy and more productivity in terms of being able to do their job no one enjoys uh, arriving at work and i'll probably I'll best not say no one most people don't enjoy going to work and doing a routine task day in and day out um, into perpetuity they want to understand and their their, their labor input that adds value and, and that's what we're seeing with these tools so when we choose use cases we choose a mix of value um you know uh, problems that are really a, a challenge to solve or we haven't been able to solve using other technologies and then really my focus as well is around people um, experience that is truly the value lever in, in our organization at present is getting better engagement with our team members thank you maybe we have time for one last question and, and maybe rohan let me get that to you so you may have read this weekend, right, at Economist, all the conversation about the energy industry and the pressure, right, that AI poses on energy generation. So there's a question that someone is asking, you know, the to what extent that energy transition, right, will be accelerated because of AI or hindered because everybody talks about AI and forget about renewables. Any right view yeah. of it? I hope it helps. We really got to sort that thing out, don't we? Um, uh I think, I mean, in the immediate term, it's not helping at all. It's incredibly computationally intensive to train these things costs tens of millions of dollars to do one training run in compute costs. And that money is effectively the cost of the energy to run the computers plus the capital cost. Um, so in the short term, it's not helping, but I do, I am optimistic that, you know, these, these new technologies as they, well, you know, this Gen AI, as it kind of learns to make us smarter, it will do that, and it will help us figure out how to um, to uh, to do make the energy transition happen. You know what I mean? So it'll coach us, you know, on, on kind of what are the different technologies available. You know, we'll be able to build virtual kind of ESG consultants that can can advise even the smallest of businesses and so forth. I'm sure it has a role to play. That's probably an unsatisfactory answer. I hope it has a role to play, um, but I guess we'll see. Like I said, I'm not very good at predicting the future. Thank you. Um, I mean, we have two minutes if you want to take maybe just kind of one final kind of remark and then we need to close. Uh, Chris, any final thoughts? I guess my final thought that this is exciting. This is change. And um, as I've, I've been saying throughout this, really focus on the people, not the technology. Thank you. Rowan. Yeah, I'd like to say, um, I mean, thank you for, for having us, Felipe. It's been a real privilege and an honor to speak with yourself and, and of this esteemed audience. Um, uh, I saw the list of who's listening and you're all very, um, uh, you know, influential, um, important people taking the time out of your day to come and listen to us um, kind of yarn about something that we're passionate about. So thank you to the audience um, and hopefully... Chris and I have gone some way to convincing you that it's worth sort of paying attention to this latest generation of artificial intelligence. Thank you so much. So let me close by, I mean, thank you. First of all, both of you, you know, it is evening for you. Thank you for taking some time and sharing so much, right, in such a candid way. It is so difficult, right? It is so difficult to get, you know, this insider's view on what's happening, especially when you are really at the forefront of it. So I feel really very privileged to have had the chance to, I learned so much from both of you. Uh, and thanks so much for all of you kind of connecting and taking you, agendas are crazy. Thank you so much for taking some time out of your day to have this conversation. Uh, I hope this is just, you no know, beginning of that conversation. We will meet again, either face-to-face -face or remotely and continue this forward. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Hi. Thanks everyone. Thanks everybody. Cheers. Cheers, Chris.